Hey there, I'm Christy. Welcome to my channel. If you're new to this channel, I am growing in Northern Alberta, Canada. I have a homestead slash flower farm. So um, one of the things that I do here on our hobby farm or homestead is I try to create sustainability. And in order for me to do that, um, I had to have some sort of an income on the property. So. A few years ago, I went on a flower farming journey and today I'm gonna to share some information with you. I specifically grow for florists. I don't design, I just grow for local florists. And last year was an interesting year because it was my first year exclusively growing for florists and it was a lot. Um, so I have some numbers for you. I have some of my top sellers and some of the ways I actually am working with florists to um, sell my, my product and um, some information that might be handy if you're interested in learning or are trying to compare notes um, as someone who's already farming or wants to make some income on your homestead. So anyway, um, we'll get right into it. I've technically am going into my fourth, fourth year of flower farming. So 2022 was the first year that I actually had grown in a structure like a 20 by 60 greenhouse foot greenhouse. Um, a heated one and it was the first year that I had exclusively grown for two florists. Um, all of my products went to one of the two florists throughout the whole season of 2022. I didn't sell off the farm very much. I sold every single stem I had and I, I had actually a very big loss as well. I lost like 60% of my crop to um, inexperience basically, but it was a lot of insect pressure and just things that I didn't know what was going on with my soil. Previously to last year, I had done a lot of learning. I had done a lot of trial and error, getting to know my climate. Where I am located, it's zone 2B, and we have a very short growing season. We have 100 days to grow. We have very long days though, so um, that is why I'm able to grow amazing cut flowers and some of the best cut flowers. So my business strategy growing, going right into this was, what can I grow well? Um, so I know a lot of other flower farmers online, they live in warmer climates and on YouTube, there's lots of people, even in Canada, Serena and Ian at um, You Can't Eat the Grass, they live in a much warmer climate than I do, even though we're both in Canada. Our, what we can grow and what does well are completely opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, this morning, <laughs> an example, it's negative 30 degrees Celsius outside and my greenhouse inside on the coldest spot in my greenhouse, I have a little it's like a little thermometer, looks like that. Um, a wireless thermometer in there in the coldest spot where I can, it talks to my phone and it says right now, um, or this morning, it said it was minus seven degrees Celsius in there. And you know, I have everything covered that's growing in the ground, but it's a little bit of a concern. So those are the sways of weather that we have in the spring. Um, and even if this, the forecast says it's gonna be, you know, minus 15, it can get to minus 30 like that. So I have to grow stuff that I, I know will handle things. And luckily for me, um, some of the most sought after flowers on the market that florists are shipping in and pay paying a premium for to order in are cool season flowers. And the reason they pay so much to get these flowers shipped in is because they're grown in places that's warmer. So they have to, you know, it takes, extra shade cover or it takes, you know, cooling or certain things um, that need to be parameters that need to be met to grow some of these cooler season flowers while it's warming up in the southern climates. So what happens is florists end up paying a lot of money for stems that we can grow really, really easily here. And I focused in on that for my for my business model moving forward to supplying florists. I am focused on flowers that do well in cool climate. Now that opens a big, a big window because that means I can have ranunculus, I can have lisianthus, I can have, I can't have roses, but lisianthus is a pretty good trade-off. Um, I can have stuff like larkspur and delphinium and all of these florals that are really, really love, they love the cool temperatures. Even dahlias, they don't like really hot nights. They like cooler daytime or cooler nighttime temperatures and warmer days. 
that's what we have here. <laughs> so the problem is, is that we have a lot of pathogens in our soil. We have a lot of issues with our climate, with um, contaminants that cause some issues with some of these tubers. So, you know, one of the par par parts to establishing this farm was to begin building my soil. And so I could grow some of these plants because I could put them in the ground and just as it was, and I wouldn't have any success and there'd be different diseases and different things that would happen caused to what was in the soil, different pathogens. So it was really learning about that stuff and kind of getting it on track. Basically, my advice to you is if you're starting a flower farm or a homestead um, garden, you just want to put in as much compost as you could. Good compost, high nitrogen compost, as much as you can, just pack it in there. Um, you can't have too much compost. And that's one of the practices that I do here is I actually create my own. I use my horse manure and chicken manure to make compost. We also haul in cattle manure and um, I'm now using fungi like mushroom spores to build on the soil, um, the stru soil structure. So I have, in, in, I have installed um, some types of uh, fungi like a wine cap mushroom. Wine cap mushrooms, they actually um, are predators of some of the damaging nematodes that we have in our soil that cause issues with the plants and we're, we're really rich on those harmful nematodes here in our soil and so um, installing those wine cap mushrooms and installing, benef installing beneficial nematodes as well really helped me keep things in check and start to rebuild on my garden last year for, for my farm so those are some of the things that I did before I went you know all all in on the flower farm was to make sure that I had some knowledge of my soil. So that's why the first couple years of flower farming, it was a lot of trial and error, seeing what was what I could do, what was going wrong, learning my climate, learning what was in the soil, learning what I needed to do. It was really important and I think it attributed to some of my success. So in 2021, the fall of 2021, I was approached by a family friend who had a 20 by 60 structure greenhouse. It was a heated greenhouse. She had a commercial, um, it was a it was commercial storefront. She would bring in plugs and sell pot bedding plants um, to our community. And she wanted to downgrade um, this past year. So she offered it to me and I bought it. Um, I paid nine thousand dollars for everything, for the whole the whole thing, the tables, the structure, the heater, the fans, the the whole shebang, the drip system, irrigation, water tank, everything was included. It was nine grand. Um, so my goal for 2022 was to make my money back on the flower farm selling to florists. I knew I didn't want to sell bouquets, so I talked to my florist. I had two florist friend, friends and I said, hey, if I do this, are you crazy enough to support me? And they're like, hell yeah. So we, we jumped on board together um, and we, I started growing flowers and just taking them buckets of flowers. So, so working with my florist here are a couple things that I learned worked really well. Um, one. I found that I was willing to support my florist. I was willing to do social media. I was willing to, you know, be on the same front line as my florist and promoting her and both of them, promoting promoting both of my florists and, and being able to show on social media what I was growing in, shouting it out to the community saying, hey, these are being delivered, you know, tomorrow at 9 a.m. or whatever to Hotchkit or to the to the nest in Manning or to Nikki Pepper Florison in Valley View. And I would just kind of promote their businesses and say, these are flat, these flowers are going there. Be sure to call and get your orders in. And guess what? So they would. People would call in and they would, they'd see the posts on social media and they'd be like, I need that in my bouquet. Can I get local flowers? And they would often, um, in, in Manning, she would sell out quite a bit. Um, so I'd have to replenish that. And, and that was perfect. I mean, um, Manning is my hometown. So it's a 15 minute, 10 to 15 minute trip in to take her new flowers. And I was doing that several times a week. And so she always had this steady rotation of florals. So what I did do, um, I was able to talk to IGA and IGA is our local grocer and they have these floral buckets in the store that they throw, they throw them away. They don't really have a use for them when their flowers come in, they throw them away their buckets. So I went and talked to them and they kept buckets for me. So I went and picked up those buckets and I, I would use those buckets to put bunches of 10 or however many 
um, of one type of flour into those buckets. I would invoice it in the field on my phone or my iPad, um, or I would write it on a paper and do it later if I was really busy. But I would strip the leaves, make sure they were clean, put them in the bucket, hydrate them really well, and then I would take them to town within six to 12 hours of harvest. Um, I would take them to my florist. No rubber bands. I started using rubber bands. We stopped doing it. It was putting so much stress on the flowers. It was adding extra work, extra time. And so what we started to do is my florist would just take that bucket and put it in her cooler. And then we would sw switch buckets. I had, an, uh, I had a bunch of buckets there. So it was just really easy. It was just an exchange. She'd give me a clean bleached bucket and I would drop off the bucket full of flowers and it would go straight into the cooler. Um, that worked really, really well for us. Um, because it was cutting off hours of time she was having to spend in her shop, stripping leaves, washing plants, sorting them. It was all done. She didn't have elastic bands to deal with. She just took it and placed it in there and she had several hours of free time on her hands that she didn't have to go through unboxing and unwrapping and unpackaging these flowers. So that was, she was really appreciative of that, both of them we were able to have a really good working relationship and stay in communication. So if she had a funeral or something come up where people come in for a service, she would call me up or text me and she'd say, do you have any of this color lily? Or do you have any of this specific thing? I need this many stems. And I'd be like, yeah, I'll go check and I'll go cut them and take them in for her. Um, it was really a good relationship that we had um, for working back and forth that way. And um, you know your business partners. Essentially, we looked at it as being partners. We're partners in success. And so she promoted me. I promoted her. Um, it was really a really good thing um, to do in in that aspect of um, you know coming together. You are working in a relationship and in harmony with someone who's supporting your your skill set, and you're supporting someone else's skill set. And so um, we just we kind of just let that bloom um, it, and it was great. We She did such beautiful work with the florals that I grew here. I couldn't be happier and I was exclusively, she was going, um, there's a lot of time where she did not purchase any flowers from her supplier. So that was awesome. Um, I was able to grow enough to supply her completely. The other thing that um, I, I learned this year is pricing. Now, oh my goodness, you know what? You will drive yourself crazy trying to price, especially if you're going off of these lists of, you know, there's only one list available for Canada um, and it's in American pricing. It has no reflection of what it actually costs here. And um, so you have to understand when, if you are someone who is selling vegetables or you're selling um, flowers off of your homestead or beef or whatever you're selling, eggs, you have to be honest and realistic with yourself that yes, there are commercial growers. Yes, there are places that have commercial pricing that they can order from, but your product and those commercial products are not the same thing. You're selling something completely, completely different. Your flowers are, you know, an example, my florist had no idea tulips. Some tulips have a scent. She had no idea. She'd never smelled that before. Snapdragons, she never in a million years, I said, these are so like, I literally picked her a bucket of snapdragons. It was the legend pink and they smell like bubble gum or cotton candy. I think they smell like cotton candy, which is probably the smell of bubble gum. Um, and I, I said, oh my goodness, it smells so good in here. I'm on my way. And she's like, you're just bringing snapdragons. I'm like, yeah, it's really, really strong. They smell really strong. And she's like, they don't smell. I'm like, yeah, they do. And I walked in and I shoved these these um, in her face, like the the legend pink in, the fa in her face. And she's like, what is that smell? And I'm like, it's the snapdragons. And she didn't believe me. She's like, these aren't snapdragons. And yeah, they're snapdragons. She never knew that, you know, she's a florist. She works with flowers for a living. And she had no idea that they had a smell. Never smelled a snapdragon before. Bells of Ireland, sometimes they are muted when they're grown commercially. They have, they lose their scent. Um, she had no idea. She didn't even know, like when you grow in the greenhouse, um, one of the things that has a beautiful smell is sunflower foliage and it kind of has a nutty smell. And so when you take, like you fill your whole vehicle up with sunflowers and they're grown in the cold and you fill your vehicle up with sunflowers and you take that into the florist and she's like, what is that smell? I'm like, it's the sunflowers. She's like, sunflowers don't have a smell. Yes, they do. 
Um, and so it's just like this mind blowing experience for them. You're not selling the same thing as what is available to them. Even the basic of basics, you don't, what you have, um, what I have to grow is not the same as what they can buy commercially. So when it comes to pricing, you're gonna drive yourself crazy if you're trying to price it commercially. And some florists will, if you wanna work with some florists, like I had one, I, I offered some product to them one time and I said, hey, I got this. And she's like, well, I can get it this price. It's much cheaper, so it doesn't make sense for me to buy it from you because I can buy it from my wholesaler commercially for this price. And it's like, yeah, okay. You know, you're gonna get one stem with one flower on it. Mine has 15 to 20 and <laughs> it lasts three weeks longer. So um, we had we had actually had cut flowers lasting a month. We had Lysianthus last a month. We had Ranunculus last three weeks. We had tulips lasting two to four weeks in the cooler, mind blown. Um, she had no idea that you could do that. So none of my florists were, you know, fully, expecting to have such fresh like they understood the whole concept of fresh flowers and stuff but even the regular things like snapdragons what they were buying was not something that you can buy um from a commercial grower so um it, it was not something that i could base my pricing on for you know i can't base my snapdragons on a commercial price as an, a commercial grower because they're not the same product. They're not the same product at all. These are fresh, these are, they're not, they're not going to um, balk at the idea of having to pay a little bit more, especially when the flowers are coming in clean, hydrated and stripped. Because when they come in, they're, you're shaving off hours and hours of work for them every week. So, no brainer. Um, so that was my business model. Work with my work with my client or my florists to make their lives easier. Give them the the most options possible and blow their mind every week with something new and exciting and something they've never experienced before. So I didn't give them a list of stuff to grow. Um, I or stuff to pick from. I said this is what I have, and they'll be like, yeah, I'll need like. 25 stems of this or just give me what you got. Usually it was that. It was my my weeks were not um I need 10 or 15 stems of this. It was can you fill fill the buckets, fill the truck, bring them in, right? Like just bring me as much as you can today. Right? That was what I would get. Bring me as much as you can today. And I would and I would sell and she'd be phoning and be like I need more. And it's like, "Okay, you know, um, so, you know, you just kind of have to work with your, with, with your florist. If she's willing or he is willing to be excited about whatever you bring and you give enough of a variety that they can actually make some really good designs. You have enough filler, you have enough focals, you have enough, you know, line flowers, you have whatever it is that they need to make a beautiful design. Um, just keep them coming. That's basically what it was. It was, they just got off of the whole idea of, ordering order forms and so many specific inventory. They just said, give me this many buckets, this many buckets, blah, 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 and we're good. Um, it was still cheaper. It was still cheaper. The flowers were lasting longer. It was still cheaper for them. Even though some of my stuff was priced more, they were spending less time on doing the day-to-day -day cleaning, stripping, um, you know, hydrating these flowers. They were spending less time, which was saving them money they were able to have get like one to two weeks more uh, cooler time on some of these stems so they weren't having to throw away as many or waste as much they were being used up and um they were just they were just selling so quickly so um you know it, it was a no-brainer for me to just come up with my pricing talk to them about it say is this fair and they're like yep i'm good with that so you know if you ended up having to use um, something in your garden. Like I ended up installing ladybugs in my garden. So I had to increase my pricing to reflect that. And I, I compensated for that as well in my pricing to make sure I recuperated. And it wasn't a lot, like some of the stems, it was like three cents or five cents a stem, um, increased over the year to add, add that or calculate that expense in because it was $700 for me to get ladybugs in, 
um, I was able to begin um, recuperating that cost per stem by adding a few cents to each one, which in the long haul, it did add up. But um, in the week to week, it wasn't that significant of a difference, if that makes any sense. Um, so let's talk some numbers. Um, I wanted to go well the structure the structure my goal was in 2021 my goal was to make enough money to pay, make the money back on the structure um and i i paid nine thousand dollars for the um structure with everything in it and i wanted to make my target was ten thousand i made just shy of ten thousand it was just slightly under ten thousand dollars of what I made for the 2022 season on cut flowers. And most of the cut flowers I did grow from seed. Had I not lost most of my crop, <laughs> I would have probably made closer to $20,000 selling to two florists. Um, I was not able to provide very large windows of time for like, one florist would be the primary and then the second florist, she would kind of be the afterthought. And if I had extra, I would supply her those. Um, so she would call me every week or message me. She's like, do you have this? Do you have this? And I'm like, sorry, I don't, I don't, I don't have that. And I just didn't have enough product to supply both of them. So I learned that the hard way. Um, I would say I could very easily for every florist that I work for in a season, I could very easily in our small towns make approximately 10,000 per florist, um, you know, based on their needs. Um, you know, weddings, funerals, graduations, you know, this year I'm targeting Mother's Day. That's a big one. Um, so there's a lot of, of room that I can, you know, that I can grow in that. So it was pretty good. Um, I don't have a breakdown of all the costs because did I make money? No, I was probably in the hole based on the expenses and the supply that I had to get. But my goal was to make ten thousand dollars and i did i had that was my profits on my sales um just just shy it was like yeah it was just under ten thousand so there's that um so i feel very confident that in this year with more knowledge um, i've invested in different things that will help me like warm castings i just made an investment on warm castings that are going to help me reestablish my soil and get rid of some of the pathogen issues that I have that are causing some havoc in my, in, on my farm um, from, from years and years and years of depleted soil. It happens, right? It gets the best of us and having clay soil is one that is challenging. Um, so I'm gonna give you a breakdown of what my most profitable flowers were or what, what I so, like what were my best sellers what did I sell the most to the florists? So I know I know there's a lot of people right now switching from doing flower farm bouquets to um, like to sell at market to selling to florists. And I'm just gonna give you my actual list. I went through my invoicing or like my my um, charts on my invoicing system, and I, I looked through to see which were my top flowers, my top selling flowers. But um, this means that this is the ones that I sold the most to my florist of. So this is what the weekly the weekly thing that was going to them this is the ones that yeah they, they were really good so number one of course the number one flower was sunflowers now you would be surprised not the bigger sunflowers the mini ones like i, I grew them really close together and i made some very small little dainty tiny little like well various sizes some were like really small some were like that different sizes of sunflowers and a diff an assortment of different colors and i sold a ton of those so my number one seller to florists was sunflowers it was a constant request especially early spring it was the white sunflowers the white nights and the white lights were constantly um being requested the second um the sec number two was lisianthus so i had ordered some plugs last year i also had made um or grown some they didn't do as as well that i grew but the plugs that i ordered in i ordered from jolly farmer last year um they they had done really well i did get two harvests off of some of them some of them i had pinched because they were getting too big i wasn't able to plant them uh, but i had them planted out in the field in early may which is absurd because um here 
we have such a delayed season that usually the ground is still frozen in the garden or it's complete mud hole and I was able to plant them. So that was really good. We did get a big dump of snow on them after though, after I planted them, but I had them covered so they were good, but I did get a really good harvest off of them. And it was, that was number two of my top sellers in 2022. Number three is status. Oh my goodness. I really could have made a lot like this status could have been my number two because I had a ton of dried stuff and I could have had more but I was giving it away I actually gave some to my floor my one floor says dry flower and um that wasn't even the beginning of it like I had so much of it that I could have like I just could have just kept going and I had multiple harvests because we have such long days status did really really well here um we had it, it produced several stems throughout the season. Number four was Larkspur. Larkspur is absolutely beautiful and it is used in so many different arrangements. My florist really, really loved it, especially the smoky eye Larkspur because it has a vintage look and that was the number one requested one. So if you are growing this year, John, uh, Johnny Seeds had the smoky eye Larkspur. Just wait to order them before, I need to order some myself. So just wait a minute before you order them. But um, if you are adding them to your flower farm, I would definitely consider that. The smoky eye Larkspur from Johnny Seeds, so good. Um, so yeah, that smoky eyes Larkspur, definitely. Number five was Amaranth. Um, my one florist does a lot of trellising, like wedding ceremonies and does a lot of structural stuff. So she needs a lot of filler. So she used quite a lot of amaranth to achieve that, to achieve the, the bulk of stuff and the texture. So um, amaranth was a really big one. Scabiosa, per, or annual scabiosa. Oh my goodness, I got sick of harvesting it. So I bet you I would have, like scabiosa would have been in my top three if I would have kept harvesting it, but it really annoyed me because it's sometimes it's kind of challenging to harvest and it just, it, it just didn't stop blooming. It just did not stop all season long. I had white and I had a black one. The white one just constantly, it just pumped out blooms all year long and they lasted a very long time. They had a really good vase life and it was every week, everyone, can you bring me a bucket of scabiosa? And it's like, you, you bet. Number seven on my list was Zinnia. I, oh, Zinnia and me have a love-hate relationship. It is so hard to grow Zinnias here because we are just not warm enough at night. Um, and we're too wet usually. So Zinnia is like a hot and dry, like drier climates. They like Kelowna. They don't like Northern, they don't like Manning, Alberta, Canada or Hotchkiss, Alberta, Canada. They don't like, they don't like it here. Um, so I do have a love-hate relationship. The stems are usually really short with zinnias, and so I struggle, but I did get, I planted like as many, I planted probably like 500 of them last year, and maybe I got like 30 decent plants to produce. It was, oh, it was so brutal. So zinnias did make my, my top list because they, once they started producing, they pumped out blooms like crazy. So it was, they made it to number seven on my top sellers. But, ugh, yeah, if I could cut one, it would be zinnias, but then it would be a really big loss for my farm. The number eight is lilies. Now, lilies are huge for weddings and funerals. And um, not just regular lilies, like the Bach ones, yes. The white Bach lilies, 100%. But the ones that you need are rose lilies. Rose lilies, I've literally seen people fight over. My florist had taken an arrangement and she set it inside a bucket that she was trying to sell. It was like a wash tub that she was trying to sell and people were not interested in the wash tub. They wanted those rose lilies. And there was literally a fight on social media of like people arguing. It was like big caps in, in like, in social media of people like yelling at each other in text saying dibs and it was hilarious i just i did not grow enough so this year i grew, i ordered like 700 of them so we should be good we should be covered and i actually have ordered enough to sell to my local area so that they can actually grow some in their garden um i ordered extra so that they can purchase the tubers um and have them as perennials in their garden so 
That was number eight, the lilies. Then number nine is, I combined the two, so it's Queen Anne's Lace and Dara. She would message me once a week. My local florist would message me once a week saying, do you have any Queen Anne's Lace? Do you have any Dara? And it was just this constant, like, you know, I would take her 10 stems. She's like, do you have 30? <laughs> it's like, go fish. Um, and then it would be between the two florists. She'd be like, they would try to get a hold of me. If they seen a picture or I post a picture, they were trying to contact me first to make sure I, I got them. So um, I grew 20 plants last year and I didn't know how well they would do. And I like, I should have grown like 50 to keep up with both of them. Um, with the two florists, I should have grew a lot of Dara and Queen Anne's lace. Both have a very different look. I price them the same. Um, they're they're semi different to harvest, but that's you know it's just one's more challenging to you know one's more dainty. Um, the Dara definitely is one that I prefer to grow and to sell, but the Queen Anne's lace it's just something that they they just really like to use. So um, the number ten is stock stock um mm -hmm. stock actually outdid um snapdragons now snapdragons you know they did not make my top 12 list but snapdragons they were they were up they were close to the thing but you know what they can always get um really really good quality snapdragons usually um from a commercial grower the Snapdragons didn't make the list because the stock was just mind blowing. The stock has such a strong fragrance. It was beautiful jewel tones. They absolutely loved the stock this year. Um, they were short stemmed, but I am improving it that this year. So stock is definitely on my top 10 list of must grow for florists. Florists cannot get enough of it because it's so cool here. I have a very long season. My stock was blooming. I still had stock in October blooming from spring because it's branching and we're so cool here. It grew the whole season and it did get some bug damage from the cabbage moths, but not as much as you would think. There was other things that they were after before the stock. So I was getting stems here and there, um, which was awesome because we're cold enough to have stock growing all year long. Bonus. And um, Number 11 and number 12 are tied. They were very even of how much I sold per stem. Um, so ranunculus and eucalyptus were the two. Now I would have sold way more had I had more. Um, I only put in like a hundred and some, cor I think corms of ranunculus. And I had, I think 70 plants of eucalyptus. And if I would have put like, three times more, I would have probably sold a lot more and then had more successions. I put them in late. So it was a lot of growing error, growers error and whatnot, but ranunculus and eucalyptus were both tied. So I definitely have a lot of room for improving this list, but that was my top t uh, 12 of what flowers were the most profitable selling to florists this year and what I sold the most of. Some other ones that, um, you may want to consider is one that's very popular is liatris but liatris is super easy to grow and lots of um, florists do grow them themselves because they're super easy to grow and they work good for dry flowers so um i did grow quite a bit of that this year and i did sell quite a bit of it but it was the white ones if you're going to be putting in liatris for florists the the purple ones are great but it's the white the white florists and ones that you want to put in because they will ask for them 14 times a week they like the white the white liatris so if i had that white liatris more frequently um i probably would have made my top five it probably would have outbeat amaranth um for how much it was being requested but in you know it is what it is i am i'm installing more of that this year here on my farm so anyway that's my list. I hope that this was information that is useful to you and inspired you to maybe try some growing some stuff or maybe even selling selling cut flowers off of your homestead. Um, one of the things that I would recommend is you know buying investing in a microscope, um, taking some 
some courses. When you're flower farming and homesteading, you're gonna do one of two things. You're either gonna spend money or you're gonna spend time. And sometimes if you don't spend the time to learn and to um, grow, you're gonna end up spending both. So do yourself a favor and start taking some information, getting some information and regenerative information about regenerative agriculture, um, especially if you're not gonna be using chemicals. What, what they will tell you, you can get chemicals of all kinds for your area, for the pests that you have, but they don't tell you when you go to buy them chemicals that when you apply them, you're adding a whole bunch of other issues that are gonna require more chemicals, more, more products that you're gonna have to buy. So um, to eliminate those costs, really learn about um, regenerative agriculture, learn about the glucose level in your plant structure, learn about how to take samples of your plant's tissue to see. Um, you want your glucose level in your plants to be over 12 um, because then that way your plants can actually repel pests. Um, they're natural def def uh, their natural defense system to fight against, say like the tarnished plant bug or the cabbage worm will you know if if they have enough nitrogen rich so rich soil and like through the compost you're giving them give you give them plenty of water to meet their needs and they are staying healthy you're not going to have issues with pathogens you're not going to have issues with pest damage and disease and you're not going to need to buy the extra product um, for sprays and treatments and your florists will appreciate that because they work with their hands and I, I for one, do not feel com comfortable applying sprays or poisons to get rid of pests on my flowers that my florists are gonna be touching with their bare hands and people are going to be putting close to their face and smelling. I won't do it and I refuse to. And um, so that's why I focus on regen regenerative egg and um, learning. It's a, it's a it's a journey and so that's how I um, or that's how I work my farm and every person you're, you know you're gonna have your own preferences and that is perfectly perfectly good for perfectly fine whatever you're comfortable with don't feel like there is a right or wrong way to have a business model you got to do what's gonna be right for you for your climate and um, my but my biggest advice is knowledge is key the rest of it will come. Just be open and be a pioneer in this and you'll figure it out. Anyway, much love. We'll see you next time. I better go uh, check my greenhouse. It's kind of cold out there. Oof. All right. Bye for now.